work with Aqua Security. Um, we help enterprises secure their cloud native deployments. And I look after the open source tools that, that we build there. Uh, and I have been involved in, with kind of containers and container security for, for quite a few years now. Uh, so earlier this year, uh, I published the, this book with O'Reilly, Container Security. Uh, you can you know, buy this from all good bookshops, um, but you can also download a free electronic copy. So if you follow that link, um, you know, don't let price be an obstacle if you're interested in, in, you know, in the material that we're covering. And in the end of this book, I have a security checklist. Now, I don't think it, it's kind of a, it's, it's more of a list of questions of things to consider because not every item in the checklist would apply to every single deployment. But you should probably work through them, think about them, think whether or not they apply to you. Um, so for example, if you work in, if you're dealing with you know, healthcare data or financial data, your security requirements will be more serious than if you're running you know, a website for a local football team or something. And um, so there's lots of different choices around container security. And uh, I hope the checklist helps formulate some questions for you. Now, that checklist has, I believe, 28 different questions. And we don't have time to cover all of them. So what I have today is a selection of different questions from different stages of the container life cycle. There are things that you can do to secure your containers from the point where you build them all the way through how you configure them, how you deploy them onto your hosts, how you run them, uh, how you inject secrets, lots and lots and lots of different touch points for security along the lifetime of a container. So. 28 items in that checklist. Definitely don't have time to cover all 28 in this uh, presentation. So I've picked six of my favorites. And I have some demos for these different uh, areas that we can consider these different questions. But I want to try something that I've never tried before. This is a, a, an experiment. We'll see how this goes. I basically want you to choose which of these topics we're going to drive into. So it's going to be a little bit like a choose your own adventure book where as a as the audience, I'm going to ask you to vote on which topic we go into. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go into that topic, we'll see, you know, how that goes, and then we'll, we'll start again. And so I've got six different questions. And uh, we'll see how many of them we can cover in the time available. So these are the different areas that I kind of have prepared that I think we can we can talk about. Uh, we have a poll, so maybe we can open that poll so you can start voting on these options. And while you're voting, I'll just very at a high level talk a little bit about these options. So they're kind of in the order of things that you can do at build time through to um, you know, at the end things that happen at runtime. Uh, for most of these, I have some demos so we can uh, uh, explore which ones you, uh, you know, we can, we can dive into them. I, as we go through each one of these topics, uh, let's do Q&A about that topic because they're all quite different. And uh, yeah, so just go ahead and vote on whichever thing you think looks interesting to you. So go back to the... Uh, you know, beginning of your container life cycle and um, you're going to be building some images. You're probably using some kind of the ICD pipeline. Uh, you might be using a, a hosted service to do that. You might be using GitHub and building everything using GitHub Actions. Or more commonly in an enterprise scenario, we see uh, kind of self-managed Jenkins, for example, um, or you know, any of the other CI/CD solutions. So a lot of the time, people 
control the machines on which their builds are running. And it's perfectly possible to run your builds in the same machines where your application code is running. Particularly if you're, um, well, I was gonna say if you're using a um, container-based build system, but actually that, it doesn't make any difference. You, you, if you have control over your own machines, you can run anything you like, and maybe you're running your build processes on the same machines as your applications. I would caution against that. Um, your build processes are sharing the same kernel as your application code. If they're running on the same host, Unless you're running them inside different virtual machines, they will share the same kernel. And although kernel escapes are rare, it's pretty scary to think about the consequences of build machines getting compromised and then being able to access your applications. And in particular, the reason why I think this is scary is because when you run a Docker file, you get to run any arbitrary code you like. Docker files can contain any instructions. So anyone who can make code changes to your Docker files can instruct your build machines to run arbitrary code. You, know, you may have code review processes or linting or something to try and police what's allowed to happen to your Docker files. Hopefully only your team, trusted members of your organization, get to change or at least approve changes to your Docker files. But let's not forget that they can run arbitrary code. And um, I think, so I have um, some, like an, an example of something that is pretty bad. I doubt you're going to do anything quite as bad as this, but I just want to kind of, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I just want to sort of illustrate how, um, how bad things can get if you're allowed to do arbitrary code in your Docker builds. Okay, so let's just rearrange these windows a little bit. So this time I have, um, this is my, well, this is my build machine, let's call it. And, let's, um, and this is, this is actually my laptop. So this is the host on which I'm running a virtual machine. But for the purposes of our demo, they are separate machines, right? And they don't share a kernel, importantly. And let's pretend that I have uh, compromised this Docker file. I'm going to use a Docker build kit experimental feature so that I can use secrets. And um, this requires me to add this line at the start to say I'm using experimental features. And then I'm gonna mount a secret uh, into, uh, as I run this build. So um, I need to set Docker build kit on, and then I can run a Docker build. And I'm going to pass in this secret. So the ID is my secret. That's how I'm referring to it inside the um, inside the Docker file. And the source of it is going to be whatever's inside that my secret text file. Um, I will remove any caches that might be lying around. And, okay, before I run it, on a separate machine, I'm going to listen on port eight, uh, 9001, I think it was. So when I run this build, I have passed the secret value out, sorry about the colors there, but I've passed it out to a separate machine. So a malicious user who could modify your Docker files could do something like this to extract all your secrets. Any secret that they're able to pass in on the Docker build, they don't necessarily have access to this file. They just have the ability to uh, 
uh, if they've been able to compromise this file, they can send that anywhere. I kind of think it's uh, quite interesting to think about just how powerful it is to run arbitrary commands inside your Docker file. And you might be thinking, well, you know, that's, that's all well and good, but you're using these experimental build kit features. We don't use that. But you can do exactly the same thing with um, the environment variables that you can pass in. So if I do a Docker build and I pass in build argument, now, and again, bear in mind that this command might be triggered elsewhere. The build might be triggered by somebody different from the person who has compromised the Docker file. Let's do no cache, and this is going to run Docker file two. I need to be listening on that port again. Oh, and I need to set up the. No, I don't. That's good. Okay, and again we've been able to listen or extract that environment variable, which might be a secret, and pass it anywhere we like across the internet, if you have full internet access. So, Docker files can be made to do dangerous things. Things get even more exciting if your build machine, which is very common, um, your CICD pipelines will often have access to the Docker socket in order to run the builds. And if that's the same Docker daemon that's running your applications, there's really no limitation. You know, this is like root access to your applications. Again, all you need to be able to compromise them is the ability to uh, interfere with the Docker file. Yeah, if you have access to the Docker socket, you can essentially do you can run commands as well. You're not just building. You could also run applications inside this um, Docker daemon because yeah, you can do anything you like over that Docker socket. So my kind of basic advice here is don't run production builds in your, uh, don't run builds in your production cluster. It is possible to do this more securely. For example, you could sandbox your uh, build processes. Um, you can also in the f hopefully near future, we'll have much more access to rootless Docker and the ability to build rootlessly means that you're not root on the machine and that makes things much, much less dangerous. So, you know, there may be people who are running builds in production and thinking, but it's perfectly safe because I'm using one of these mechanisms. If you're not using one of these mechanisms, if I were you, I would be extremely careful. Okay, um, question there, you can from the Docker file start a Docker run. So um, yeah, if you're, so long as the, um, uh, instance of Docker you're running in has access to the Docker socket, then yes. Uh, that makes me think I need to build a new demo. 